Hello. Uh, Good yes. afternoon, sir. Yeah, please go right. ahead. Uh, my question is regarding to the differential analysis 19. Yes. Uh, in the last line, we have that tau i j is equal to tau j i. So, what? Uh, how to physically in interpret this relation? So, I mean, is uh, what is actually the meaning of this relation? Yeah. So, the the question is on uh, differential analysis slide number 19. Uh, where we showed uh, that the shear stresses occur in pairs. In other words, uh, tau j i equal to tau i j, uh, where i is not equal to j of course. So, tau x y equal to tau y x etcetera. And the question is, uh, what is the, the meaning involved here uh, or the what is the physical meaning? Uh, to be honest with you, I am not too sure if there is any specific uh, physical meaning. At least, I am not aware of uh, any specific uh, specific physical meaning associated with this. This is a result that we obtain by essentially implementing what is called as the differential momentum, angular momentum equation, which is what we are doing in this case. That we are taking moments about the the point O, and doing so. We are just bringing about this uh, this uh, result that uh, tau y x is equal to tau tau x y, and the the physical argument involved, as you perhaps remember, was that uh, as we shrink this particle, we don't really expect for no reason the angular acceleration experienced by the particle to start tending toward uh, unnecessarily large values. Uh, so, to be honest with you, I am not too sure if there is any more physical uh, uh, meaning associated with this uh, analysis than what we have just talked about. Just give me a day or so, then I, I let me go back to uh, some of the, the texts and see if there is anything else. But as far as my understanding goes, it was essentially to, to generate this particular property of uh, the shear stresses that they occur in pairs, that that is all it was. Sir, as far I think. Uh we can interpret this relation as like that. If the particle is rotating with constant angular, velo angular velocity, so it, it keep rotating with constant angular velocity. And if it is irrotational, then uh, it means it is not rotating, then the particle remains in the same state. Can we in interpret this relation like that? I unfortunately do not think so. I do not think you can interpret it this way. because. Uh, as of now, there was no mention here of any rotational or irrotational motion. Um, the only discussion here is related to the the the, the various uh, stresses that are acting on the on the particle, and we have identified those as the normal and um, viscous stresses. It so turns out that if you take this moment about the the center point and so on, you can show that the property of the shear stresses is such that they occur in pairs. So, that tau y x equal to tau x y etcetera. I really do not think uh, as far as my understanding goes that it has anything to do with uh, rotationality or irrotationality of the flow. It is just the, the angular acceleration just used as a vehicle to, to show that uh, the shear stresses occur in pairs. Uh, at least that is what my understanding is. Uh, as I said, uh, just give me a day or so. In case, uh, in case I come across something more in, uh, informing, I'll I'll inform you. Uh, my name, next question is regarding to the exact solution number 19. In the last line, uh, we have we have taken a fully developed flow. So as a result of that, we have del del u by del x is equal to zero, and u is not a function of x. If the the actually the plate is inclined, and According to me, that the flow in the x direction is uh, so sorry, flow velocity in x direction is keep keep on increasing. Means if you consider two point on a plate, say u1 and u2, and take u2 minus u1 upon x2 minus x1, that may be positive. So I think uh, this assumption is valid or what? This is I think a good question. Uh, the question is about this uh, problem. Of fully developed flow inclined down in inclined plane, as shown on uh, slide number 19. The question is basically whether uh, this assumption of fully developed flow, as we are implementing here, 
uh, is realistic or not. Uh, physically speaking, uh, it is not really realistic in the sense that if you talk about a finite length uh, uh, inclined plane and somehow you generate this film, uh, it is very likely that it will accelerate. There is, uh, there is no question about that. However, the implicit assumption built into this situation is that the extent of the plate that we are talking about is very, very large in the x direction. So, that there is no boundary condition so to say in the x direction. In which case what ends up happening is if there is no boundary condition in the x direction which was not explicitly mentioned I understand that, but let us assume that uh, if there is no boundary condition that, that we can think of because the x direction is very, very long. Then this uh, fully developed situation uh, in the sense that you do not have an x variation of the x velocity is actually not, uh, not too bad. Uh, it is at the end of it all these situations are artificial in some sense. So, we have to we have to treat all these situations with a pinch of salt as they say. None of these is really uh, uh, mimicking any reality that correctly. It is just that to point out some scoping calculations, some of these assumptions are built in and uh, we have to take the assumptions in the right spirit in the sense that we cannot uh, really uh, take them too seriously. At the same time, uh, these are reasonably ok assumptions in the sense that they give something useful eventually which can help you understand the, the physics of the problem that that is all really it is in all these cases. See uh, let me let me continue that with uh, with a little more uh, uh, information. If you go on to slide number 21 on this what you end up seeing here is that uh, the entire left hand side uh, becomes 0 because of our assumptions and what is left then is only the mu times d 2 u d y squared and the rho g sin theta terms. Physically speaking the way to interpret this situation is that the flow is established such that it is it is flowing with a uniform velocity under the dynamic equilibrium of uh, the body force and the viscous force. So, in that sense it is to be interpreted that let us assume that you know you, you have a sufficiently long length along the inclined plane. So, that some sort of a dynamic equilibrium between at least two types of forces. See here uh, in particular uh, the gravity force is important because it is actually causing the, 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 the flow. Uh, that is the, the implicit physical understanding that is uh, built into this problem. As I said none of these problems that we have talked about is really Mimicking, mimicking any real life situation that accurately. So, in that sense your answer is also fine, but uh, we have to go with these assumptions anyway. Sir, in uh, differential analysis slide 14, uh, you have taken a triangular section for analysis. Is there any special significance attached to it? Uh, yeah. So, the question is uh, back to the triangular uh, element on differential analysis and the question is, is there any special significance? associated with why we have chosen a triangular element. The significance is that we wanted to point out um, the state of stress, what is meant by state of stress and the state of stress at a point when you want to call a point in a moving fluid. I do not want to necessarily specify that point in any particular direction. It has to be any random direction in, in that sense. So, that is the reason this inclined plane is chosen at some, some random angle theta. So, that eventually when we take the fluid element and shrink it to a very, very small size, we are talking about some randomly chosen direction in the, in the fluid at a given point. And the, the, the objective was to show then that the state of stress at random in a moving fluid can be express, expressed completely in terms of four stress components which are acting on these two mutually perpendicular uh, planes which are passing through essentially the same point. So, the, the significance is to bring about the fact that we are talking about state of stress at a random point in the sense that a random orientation point and that always can be expressed equivalently in terms of the four uh, 
stress components acting on the two mutually perpendicular planes passing through the same point. So, that that is all the physical uh, or the, the significance in, the, in general associated with this, uh, this situation is. See normally uh, you do not see this kind of uh, analysis in uh, standard undergraduate fluid mechanics books. Uh, if you open the book by Gupta and Gupta, which I have uh, listed as one of the uh, one of the reference books for fluid mechanics, you will actually see this analysis there, and uh, it's a useful analysis to to do to realize that how we connect a state of stress at a point in fluid, which is oriented randomly uh, with uh, stress components on two or three mutually perpendicular planes. That's all it is to it. Uh, again in the differential analysis slide number 35 in the energy equation the work done related term p del v is dropped so any reasons for that the question is if uh, the work done term p times the divergence of velocity is dropped um, is there any reason for it uh, if you look at slide number 4, 34 as it is uh, projected right now Actually, from the, the equation at the top here to the equation at the bottom, uh, it is not dropped. It just get converted, this p times divergence uh, velocity term gets converted into the substantial derivative of uh, pressure when we incorporate the definition of enthalpy. So, instead of uh, internal energy. So, that way it is not dropped uh, in, in, in this pair of equation. Where it is dropped? is when we go to the next page and when we uh, summarize the equations for constant density flows. So, for constant density flows you will uh, remember that the divergence of velocity is identically equal to 0. So, only for the case of constant density flows this uh, uh, p dot sorry p times uh, del dot v term is, uh, is neglected or dropped, but in general that is not the case. In page 35, sir, uh, slide 35, it is not there. That is that is precisely what I just said. In slide 35, the equations are derived, or rather, equations are shown for constant density situation. So, for constant density situation, del dot v is identically zero from our uh, continuity equation, and that is why it is dropped. The analysis up to slide number 34 does not assume constant density. Only when slide number 35 comes. I am summarizing those for constant density. Uh, so, that is the, the difference between material up to slide number 34 and then uh, the result shown on slide 35. Sir, uh, can you give any specific reference for the exact solution which you uh, discussed today for fully developed flow between infinite parallel plates where the Nusselt number is 8.24. Can you give a specific reference for getting all the steps in this? So, the, the question is uh, if I can suggest a, uh, uh, a reference wherein the, uh, the solution for that Nusselt number equal to 8.24 solution uh, in that pair of uh, parallel plates is worked out. Uh, let me, uh, let me uh, write it on the whiteboard. I think uh, these uh, these two books, which I am uh, mentioning, in uh, I mean there are many more uh, convection heat transfer books, 
but definitely something very, very close to what we worked out is uh, I think available in the Usthausen and Naylor's book on convective heat transfer analysis. Uh, Case and Crawford is a very standard uh, convection, I do not remember the exact title, it is either the convection heat transfer or convective heat transfer, but it is again a uh, uh, one of the most standard books followed for convection uh, heat transfer. Um, to be honest with you, I do not remember if the exact uh, solution that we worked out is available in either of those, but I know for a fact that uh, Usthausen's book has something very, very similar. Um, maybe it is exactly the same thing that we have worked out. So these are a couple of references which uh, which you can uh, which you can use. Sir, I have two questions. My question is: uh, We have considered the thermal conductivity in this particular case. That is minus k multiplied by delta tau by del y divided by yes. That's that's where we have considered the thermal conductivity. My basic two questions are: uh, Number one. Uh, should we consider this thermal conductivity as of the flow is having the relative velocity with uh, respect to the uh, two consecutive layers uh, while flowing from z y is equal to 0 to y is equal to h because it is not like a co like a same velocity between the two layers it's a relative velocity between the two layers and second question is uh, if we multiply in the numerator uh, the conductivity should not we multiply it in the denominator also. Yeah, so the, the question is uh, on exact solution 8 um, where um, what we are doing is uh, we are trying to show something specific to this problem in particular that minus k times dt dy is uh, obtained at the in the denominator sorry in the numerator here. So, the question is uh, where is this k coming from? Uh, let me try to answer this in the sense that if you look at the, the leftmost part here, uh, this is basically coming from the previous step which is which is here. What we have uh, what we have argued is that the quantity inside the square brackets is essentially not a function of x. So, therefore, the derivative of that quantity with respect to y is also not a function of x. Now, what is done is this derivative is actually operated on the terms inside. So, let me try to uh, let me try to go to the whiteboard and I will try to explain what, what I meant by, by this. So, I split this minus oh sorry plus minus T of x y divided by T s of x minus T m of x. So, this first bracket is completely a function of x. So, the y derivative of something that is completely a function of x will go away and what will be left is this d dy operate see again denominator here is only a function of x. So, as far as the differentiation with respect to y is concerned it is going to be a constant and therefore, this uh, partial differential with respect to y will only operate on the numerator and that is why we obtain first minus uh, del t del y if you want whole thing divided by and of course, this is not equal to a function of x on the right hand side T s of x minus T m of x not a function of x. So, then I have simply multiplied this by k and actually 
then I should be multiplying here by k as well. So, that step I have not shown that I have really multiplied the right hand side and left hand side let us say, but k if it is a constant, it is not going to change the, the nature of the right hand side and it will still remain as not a function of x. On the other hand, minus k times dt dy, if especially evaluated at y equal to 0, will be identically the heat flux that is provided at the wall. This is from Fourier's law of conduction, because at y equal to 0, what we have is essentially a stationary fluid. If you, uh, if you go back at y equal to 0, which is, uh, which is the bottom plate, what we have is very close to the wall, because of the no slip condition, the flow is essentially 0 value and therefore, right at the wall, when the heat transfer occurs from the wall into the fluid, right at the wall that is, it is purely by conduction and the heat flux then is given by minus k times dt dy evaluated at y equal to 0. So, the idea here was or is in general to show that once you replace this minus k times dt dy as the heat flux at the wall, we realize that heat flux divided by the surface temperature minus the mean temperature is actually independent of x, but by definition in an internal flow situation like this, the heat flux divided by the surface temperature minus the mean temperature is nothing but the convective heat transfer coefficient. So, uh, there is nothing incorrect here, it is just that uh, when I multiplied this minus uh, sorry by, by the conductivity k on the left hand side, it is understood that it was multiplying the right hand side also. So, there was some right hand side which is not a function of x let us say and because the conductivity k is assumed to be constant, that nature of the right hand side is still remaining the same namely the right hand side is remaining as not a function of x. So, that is what it was supposed to supposed to mean. I, I hope that is uh, clear little bit more now. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, yeah, RK College. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, am I am I on the right slide that that you had asked something about uh, positive uh, nature of the shear stress on the inclined surface? Shear stress. Yeah. So, I, the, I'm I'm not really convinced about my own answer that I gave you. Uh, in fact, I I wanted to have a little bit of more discussion on that in the sense that you you pointed out that whether we can look at uh, the two components here and with respect to those two components for the shear stress, if we can uh, if we can come up with uh, the conclusion that this can be considered as a positive uh, shear stress. If you uh, if you resolve it, so let me go to my whiteboard and uh, draw the picture. Uh, I, I suppose this is what you were referring to. If we uh, if we resolve this into these two components, and then if we can uh, if we can consider each of these two components to be uh, positive, then we can come up with a conclusion that the inclined uh, surface shear stress is positive. Is is that correct? What you were trying to say? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, these two components, if we uh, combine with uh, a normal. Yeah, yeah, I understood. So, I actually understood it. Uh, it is a really good thought, let me uh, let me say that. Uh, and also, I will say that I am not convinced about my own answer. So, I am going to retract that answer and I am going to come back to this maybe in a day or so with little more clarity. Uh, the problem with what you are suggesting right now, as I see it right now, other than the fact that it is a really, really good thought, is that uh, we are essentially saying then that uh, the horizontal component can be considered to be acting on a fictitious vertical surface pointing in this fashion and the uh, vertical component can be considered to be acting on a fictitious surface which is also pointing downwards. And that is the way we combine the two to say that uh, both of them are positive and therefore, the inclined surface uh, is positive. 
So, I, I think I understood your logic and uh, I really appreciate the thought that, that you have uh, given to this. It is just that the only question I want to um, clarify to myself before I come back to you is that we can indeed combine these two fictitious surfaces to represent the inclined surface. So, I have not been able to convince myself so far that the two fictitious uh, surfaces, the vertical surface and the, the horizontal surface can be essentially combined in some sense to, to represent our inclined surface. So, let me give it a thought uh, tonight and uh, I will remember this and I will come back to you tomorrow if you do not mind. Okay, thank you. No problem sir, thank you very much. Yeah, so, but uh, yeah, I really appreciate the, the thought process though, it is very well thought. Uh, let me just make sure that uh, if this is the convincing answer, I will I'll try to explain it to you tomorrow. So, thanks a lot again. Uh, yeah, Cummins College Pune, if you have a question, please go ahead. Uh, my question is regarding application of Navier-Stokes equation, uh, not for a particular slide rather. Uh, suppose we are having one fluid, rather it is a gas. Uh, it is moving and uh, by chance, by any mean, second type of fluid also, also enters in the first fluid, uh, but quantity of second uh, gas is very smaller and I want to predict uh, motion of this second fluid inside the first fluid. Uh, second fluid may be in very smaller quantity as compared to first fluid, rather maybe uh, it reduces to molecular level, bunch of molecules. So, can it be possible to predict uh, motion of this second fluid or molecules of second fluid by means of Navier-Stokes equations? or shall we go for statistical thermodynamics process, uh, which, method will, uh, which method will gives us accurate result or result possibly very close to accuracy. This can be a real life problem. Yes, so the, the question is about a situation where uh, there are, uh, there is a gas flow and in this gas flow another different gas is entrained uh, as an additional flow let us say. Uh, what is getting pointed out is that the, the second gas flow can be really, really small in amount compared to the primary gas flow. And if uh, Navier-Stokes equations can be, uh, can be employed to simulate such a, um, such a situation. So, uh, this is actually a very, very tough question to answer to be honest with you, but let me try my best. Uh, if the, if as you are saying, if the amount of the second gas is really in traces in the sense that uh, it is really a few molecules uh, as you are saying, then I will have to say that uh, you must have, you, you will have to resort to uh, some sort of a statistical method rather than uh, using Navier-Stokes equation. If both of those gases are uh, in, uh, in plenty of quantity with each of them really um, satisfying the continuum uh, assumptions cleanly, then uh, in Averstokes equations enhanced by some sort of a uh, mass diffusion equation uh, can be utilized to simulate this problem. But if you are saying that the other gas is in really trace amount, uh, my gut feeling is that it is uh, it's probably going to require a, a statistical uh, statistical method to act obtain accurate solution. Actually, uh, if we use any kind of uh, CFD software, this gives us uh, probably uh, somewhat good result, but uh, if we want to solve them by mathematical process, uh, I think uh, if we are using CFD software, definitely they are based on Navier-Stokes equations, but if we are solving it by mathematical me method. Uh, uh, as per your view, I think uh, statistical thermodynamics processes will give us accurate result. Yes, that is that's, uh, that's what my opinion is, yes, that would be the correct thing to do. Okay, thank you. Can you please uh, solve the equation by putting the value of h in the first equation? Because I have tried that, actually the uh, second equation uh, we are not getting actually. <laughs> okay, uh, so, so the question is about uh, converting the the top equation into um, the, the equation that I have written in terms of uh, enthalpy and uh, they tried it, but they are not getting it. So, let me see if I can if I can do it myself. Yeah, let me try that.
I, I hope uh, you have followed so far, and and that's it. Actually, the next step is the what you want. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. SGSITS Indore, if you have a question, please uh, please go ahead. Sir, uh, my question is from differential analysis slide number two twenty three. Uh, I want to ask whether these two coefficients of viscosity. Uh, the lambda coefficient of viscosity is it kinematic coefficient or is it, if it is not then what is the physical or practical significance of the second coefficient of viscosity uh, yes yeah, so the question is on uh, slide number 23 differential analysis where this sec, uh, dynamic coefficient sorry the first coefficient of viscosity or the dynamic viscosity and the second coefficient of viscosity are mentioned and the question is uh, whether the second coefficient is called kinematic uh, coefficient so the answer to that is no uh, there is no such uh, nomenclature associated with the second coefficient it's simply a second coefficient uh, actually i need to perhaps apologize for uh, putting up this uh, slide in a slightly haphazard manner in the sense that we have not really discussed the entire stokes development uh, which is actually a fairly tedious business what i have simply showed is that it turns out at the end of the analysis that the viscous component to a normal normal stress in a in a fluid appears to be having two coefficients eventually in the in the expression that that is obtained after the stokes analysis is over and one of them can be shown to be the the first coefficient of viscosity as it is called equal to the dynamic viscosity and there exists the second coefficient of viscosity which is simply called as the second coefficient of viscosity so uh, the, what ends up happening is that uh, only if there is a compressible flow where the uh, summation of the uh, strain rates as given by e dot xx plus e dot yy plus e dot zz here which is the divergence of velocity non zero then we need to bother about the second coefficient of viscosity if the flow is incompressible we don't have to one way or the other uh, it is simply called as the second coefficient of viscosity and it will appear only if the flow is uh, extremely compressible in nature typically the occurrence of second coefficient of viscosity is required to be considered only if you are uh, looking at uh, structures of shock waves what i can do is uh, so i apologize for that but right now you simply uh, note down that there are two coefficients that show up after the stokes analysis is done as far as our overall objective is concerned for the cfd we don't need to know these kinds of detail uh, this this is a fairly tedious uh, derivation and it needs to be uh, it needs to be studied carefully thank you thank you so much sir uh, yes mufakam ja please go ahead sir in case of flow over surfaces how do we define the detachment of flow that is my first question and my second question is uh, regarding conservation equations continuity momentum and energy how do we solve them uh, is it uh, sequentially or uh? yes so there are uh, there are two questions uh, one is uh, uh, a general fluid mechanics question and the question is uh, for flow over surfaces um, how do we uh, define a detachment of the flow uh, so actually we haven't talked about those kinds of fluid mechanics details uh, so the quick answer to that is uh, this is related to essentially uh, a boundary layer separation kind of uh, uh, situation and uh, if you see when the flow in the boundary layer separates the condition that uh, seems to be satisfied is that uh, the shear stress at uh, at the at the location where there is detachment occurring uh, essentially becomes equal to zero so that is the the condition that uh, that will uh, signify the beginning of detachment of the flow uh, so that's as far as your first uh, first question is concerned um, on the second question i will simply say that uh, why don't you just wait for a few days and uh, by the time we complete our uh, workshop next week all your answers as to how we solve the navier stokes equations the moment continuity equation and the energy equation uh, 